Welcome back, my lovely students that are interested in chest and abdominal trauma. All right, this is for the EMT class again. <clears throat> As usual, I'm going to try and boogie on through this stuff. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, send me an email, hangout, or uh, text. You guys know how to get a hold of me. Um, this will be chest and abdominal trauma, and there's a couple very specific things in here that I'm going to kind of go over and cover for you guys uh, that are a little different in how you handle them. So, as usual, the objectives um, you can pause and take a look at, but these are the things I want to try to cover. Videos are not streamable during my presentations, unfortunately, so you can go look those back up, and there's plenty of other uh, areas you can look at some of these. Uh, your core concepts are the real big objectives we want to have. By the time you get done with this chapter and your quizzes, you um, should be able to handle that. So, let's talk about chest injuries from trauma. So, there's blunt, uh, all sorts of things can happen. A lot of musculoskeletal, so the sternal rib, uh, even the cartilage that's kind of holds that all together. There's muscles that can happen for the intercostal muscles, that kind of stuff. Um, the compression from a rapid issue. We talked in the last chapter about penetrating wounds and some specific ones to chest that you really want to worry about are going to be, uh, or excuse me, the specific penetrating trauma uh, that deal with the chest and I generally even in some places in the torso so even abdominal wounds we started talking about in the last session and again this one will reinforce that is the occlusive dressing so not only uh, is there damage to the tissue and, and sub uh, sub tissue areas where your organs are in there, but you can be introducing air into that chest cavity as well, so that's a problem. Um, closed chest injuries, and one of those um, that we really want to look for, and uh, I've seen a couple of these over the years, um, they happen uh, from blunt trauma, um, often from uh, uh, motor vehicle collisions, uh, is where I've run into them. Um, where you have three or more uh, sections of rib broken in two places. So if you look at this this image, it shows you have three or four of them in that one image, and this other one there's three. But you have a couple of several ribs that are broken in both sections, so they're no longer attached to the rest of the rib cage, and it's a free floating section of rib. What the problem with that is, is as we start then to breathe, we the whole chest works as this bellows, and we, it has to work together. So that whole chest, rib cage, intercostal muscles, diaphragm, diaphragm contracts, pulls down, creates a much bigger space. We create lower pressure inside the body, so it pulls in air. Well, if that section isn't attached, it can't help with that process. And in fact, what will do and will reveal itself in it will move opposite the rest of the chest. So it's called paradoxical motion. Do a Google search um, for videos of flail chest and you'll see what that looks like. And when we get into class, I'll try and show you as well. But you're looking for paradoxical motion or as you're palpating the chest, you maybe find a big chunk of the chest that's unstable in the size of your hand, for example. That's going to be an issue, um, not only because you've got broken ribs that's painful, but because it's going to inhibit that, that patient's ability to breathe. There aren't, um, there are some uh, treatments um, uh, in the past has been anything from putting a sandbag on it or a bulky dressing to splint it. The current thinking that I've been seeing in the research I've been doing right now, the only real treatment for that is positive pressure ventilation. Because if we take over their breathing and we put positive pressure ventilation, so we're taking high pressure from outside and putting it in, that motion will become non-paradoxical. -paradoxic it will actually go with the rest of the chest cavity, minimizing that uh, risk of injury by the bones rubbing against each other, the blood vessels underneath, and, and the, uh, the nerves that run along with that. So... <clears throat> um, Oxygen is going to be a good one. Uh, the positive pressure ventilation might help with that flail segment. Um, 
And if they can't get a good amount of ventilation, we're going to need to breathe for them anyway. So positive pressure moves way up the list for me um, if they'll tolerate it and if it's something that we can do. This is another case where uh, an advanced life support intercept, um, especially uh, ones with uh, uh, rapid sequence intubation capability where we can intentionally paralyze and sedate the person to take over their breathing for them. Um, if you don't have ALS intercept, um, again, getting them to a hospital. And this is a case where um, if you don't have the choice or if the trauma system allows for it, getting them to some place that can provide that airway management first may be a, a, a good choice. Again, follow your local guidelines. Open chest injuries, um, you have to assume the worst. We have no idea. Uh, how much, how deep, is it superficial, is it not? Um, if you see frothy, bubbly uh, kind of bleeding from that, there's a really good indicator that you've got air moving in and out of into the chest, but you, you can't always tell that. So assume all penetrating chest injuries are uh, all the way into the chest and potentially are allowing air to develop in there. We we'll call it starting a pneumothorax. So we're going to use occlusive dressings. So what if it's bleeding and penetrating? Well, we'll put a gauze pad directly on the wound to help control the bleeding and then put a larger occlusive dressing over the top of that. So if you do not have a commercially available occlusive dressing, you can make an improvised one with a large piece of plastic uh, wrapper from a bandage or uh, uh, wrapping material from like an IV bag or something along those lines. Be sure it's heavier plastic so it doesn't allow it to go through and it's significantly larger than the hole you're trying to cover up. You don't want to put uh, you know, a hole the size of your index finger so you cut a small uh, piece of plastic about that same size, you set it over, they take a breath in and it sucks it right on into their chest. You want it to be much larger than that. So the idea is to block up that, uh, that hole and allow preventing air from getting into the chest. There may or may not be that gasping or, or sucking sound. Um, you may or may not have diminished lung sounds on that side. So again, presume any penetrating trauma to the chest is introducing air in, and we're going to prevent that with an occlusive dressing. So here you see some examples of that. One of the ideas when you do that is you tape it mainly on three sides, leaving an extra side open. And the reason for that is if pressure in the chest builds up to a point where it's higher than outside, it can actually burp itself out. It essentially becomes a relief valve and go out the side of that three-sided taping. Um, if you can't remember that or you're having a hard time, go ahead and just completely tape it all the way off. But the idea would be is if, if you look at this uh, picture, it's kind of showing that as you breathe in, it's going to suck right up against the skin, but as the pressure builds up, it'll kind of squirt itself on out of there. If ALS is available, again, this is a really good one to, to uh, be asking for help on. We have abil uh, the ability to uh, decompress the chests. Um, they may also need advanced airway management. So, if you notice these during the primary assessment, is this something, so just for an example, you have a penetrating uh, wound to the patient's chest. Is that something that you catch during your head-to-toe exam, or should, if we see it during our ABCs, would that be something that's threatening our A and our B? In most cases, I would consider that being something we need to address during the uh, primary assessment, during that uh, airway breathing circulation check and intervening if you uh, find it there. If you don't find it until you start your head to toe because it's you know obscured or something, we stop at that point and immediately fix that. So just kind of showing again that idea of the three-sided. So you can have a, a, a pneumothorax, which can happen without any external hole. Uh, say you have a blunt trauma. Um, you can have a pop, you know, the, the, you can have a rupture inside the lung anyway, and so as you're breathing in, it's leaking out the other part of the lung and developing a pneumothorax inside the chest as well. So it doesn't have to necessarily be open out to the atmosphere through the chest wall. It can be coming out from a wound in the lung itself. A hemo 
thorax is just like pneumo, just in this case hemo, it's going to be blood in that cavity. Almost all of the same issues come into play. It, uh, de it, if left untreated as it continues to build, it will collapse that long or restrict its ability to function. And as it becomes a tension hemo or pneumothorax, it starts to put pressure on the heart, not letting it refill properly. Now you have a, a pump problem um, into a point where it can actually start pushing to the other side. And in many of these cases, you have some bleeding and some air, so it's called a hemopneumothorax. So all of those kinds of things, uh, those are very bad and, and need to recognize that. Traumatic asphyxia um, usually happens of sudden uh, uh, compression, like a car falling on somebody's chest. I've seen it, uh, well, two come to mind, uh, but it does happen. Um, what ends up happening is you actually get this backflow of blood just poof, comes on out. You, pretty much from the nipple line on up, you have this dark purplish blue color and uh, distended neck veins, a lot of stuff. It is really, um, it is a grossly distracting injury. In most of these cases, uh, I have not heard of anybody that wasn't already in cardiac arrest at this point, but I guess it can happen. But uh, that comes from that sudden compression, something very heavy or a very large amount of force hitting the chest quite suddenly. Uh, the two that I've seen, uh, one, the guy was working on a car and his car jacks failed and the car ended up on his chest. The other one was from a rollover and the car landed on top of him. Cardiac tamponade, um, I mentioned earlier in one of my other lectures, we'll talk about directly. So this is a closed chest injury. So the pericardial sac, it's a big protective uh, sac that sits around the heart. It's got a small amount of fluid in the middle of it that uh, kind of keeps it lubricated and the heart itself sits in there so it can do its thing. It's beaten all day long and, and no big deal. Um, Sometimes, um, when there's trauma involved, bleeding can occur on the inside of that sac. So either something on the outside of the heart or uh, injury to the uh, pericardial sac itself, and it's now leaking uh, or bleeding inside that space. So outside of the heart, but inside of the sac. The best way I can describe what would happen is much like an attention pneumothorax or hemothorax, but now imagine the cardiac tamponade is take the blood pressure cuff, cuff, so take the bulb for the blood pressure cuff, put it in your hand, close the valve, wrap it around your hand with the Velcro and start pumping. First several times you're pumping, no big deal. Everything's working just fine. You can expand your, your fist and open it all up. It lets more air into there. You can pump that all out. Well, as that pressure increases inside the blood pressure cuff, imagine the same thing as the pressure inside the pericardium is starting to fill up. Eventually, um, the pressure outside that's inside the sac, the pericardial sac, is pushing on the heart to the point where it can't open up or uh, relax to the point where it can refill. So the heart cannot actually get refilled, therefore it can't pump anything else out. And you run into some pump problems. The cardiac, uh, uh, one of the signs of that is um, distended neck veins, and that's one of the things that we're looking for when we talk about JVD, jugular venous distension, when we start doing our patient assessment. That's what we're looking for. Now, most people, when they lay down, their, their jugular veins get bulge out a little bit, but if they're profoundly up, you have a mechanism of injury, or if they're in a semi-recliner sitting position and you notice that, that can be a problem. Um, they're also going to be showing signs of hypoperfusion because the pump isn't working the way it's supposed to. They've had a mechanism of injury that's usually penetrating trauma to the chest. Um, if you were to listen to their heart tones, um, I am not an expert at that, but it would probably sound far away. And um, it probably are going to have clear lung sounds because this is usually isolated to that pericardium. Now, you could have that and a new pneumothorax and multi-system, you wouldn't notice that. This last line on the shock and the narrowed pulse pressure, so they're going to be showing the signs of the shock. What pulse you do feel will be rapid. The breathing will probably be rapid because, again, they're not moving blood around to where it needs to get to. And when you take the blood pressure, that narrowed pulse pressure, the top number and your bottom number, your systolic and diastolic, as this progresses, will become closer to each other. So, for example, as you first take it, they have a blood pressure of 110 over 70. Well, 
as you check it again, as this bleeding keeps filling up that sac, the, the resting pressure gets higher. So your next pressure is going to end up being 106 over 80. And then it's going to be 100 over 90. And eventually, as the heart stops, the inter the both the beating and the nut. The idea is, is that pressure builds up. Your diastolic or resting heart pressure, uh, blood pressure, is going to be higher and higher, um, and the ability for it to do any kind of a contraction on the way out will be lower and lower. So those two numbers will start to come back together. Um, if you have any questions on narrow pulse pressure, make sure you ask me uh, during class and I can show you some other examples. But that's another key indicator um, that you have something pressing on that. Those can show up also in pneumo and hemo tension, tension, pneumotension, hemothorax. There are um, some specific injuries to the aorta that can also happen. Um, you can either uh, tear, um, so where not, you can tear the aorta, now again, penetrating trauma or even in blunt trauma, that can happen. So say a stab or a gunshot where you actually cut the aorta, um, that's usually that last one. If you actually get a direct tear where it's bleeding out into either the, the um, thoracic portion or in the ab abdominal area, um, by the time we get there, it's very likely that they will already have bled to death before we even get there. Um, if you have a complete um, open wound from the aorta, yeah, very little can be done at that point. However, not all of them do that. Um, there are some where uh, in a sudden deceleration injury, for example, um, especially if the older uh, the patient might be, the aortic arch as it comes up off of the heart um, is fixed pretty well. And if there's a lot of calcification that goes along with that, it may be fairly rigid. And then the big floppy heart is uh, able to move. So that object in motion tends to stay in motion. So you have a sudden deceleration. The heart tends to continue moving while the you know the chest impacts the steering wheel. So the heart keeps going just a little bit longer and maybe tears a little bit of the aorta where it's calcified and more rigid and it doesn't have as much flexibility. So you get a tear. Maybe it doesn't go all the way out. Maybe it's the inner lining of the aorta. Those can cause some blood pressure issues. It can cause bleeding down inside the lining of the aorta. So it's not going down the vessel out into the body where it's supposed to. It's going into a false cavity um, where it's not uh, doing any good and can get bigger and bigger to a point where it blocks off the, the true uh, portion of the uh, the pipe, uh, the vessel itself. So uh, any pain in the chest, abdomen, back, the idea of looking for differing blood pressures between the right and the left arms is as it goes through the aortic arch, the subclavian arteries come off of there. And depending on where that tear is, the um, you may get a decent blood pressure on the right side because it's not in, in, impacted, but on the left, um, the tear may already be have occurred and now is not getting uh, blood going out to that side. So you don't feel a pulse in the left arm or you have a much lower blood pressure on that side versus the right side. Uh, a lot of different things you can look at or where you have good strong pulses up in the upper extremities, but you have a lot of pain in the abdomen um, and then very weak pulses at the uh, lower extremities where perhaps you have an aortic uh, injury in the medium. Um, Comitio cordis. I'm probably not pronouncing that right. I know how it goes in my head, but this is those rare cases um, where uh, the... Tr you have a traumatic blow to the chest at exactly the right part of the, the heartbeat where it's vulnerable. It's extremely rare, but it happens from time to time. You'll hear about it in, uh, in the news maybe once a year, uh, every couple of years. But essentially, again, in springtime in baseball, but this is a, a, the one that I hear of most often is somebody either gets punched in the chest or takes like a fastball or softball right to the chest. It happens at just the right time. Um, and it basically puts the heart into ventricular fibrillation. So um, there's usually not a lot of traumatic damage underneath. So the 
the tissue itself is just fine. What happened to it is, is when that happens, there's a small electrical charge that happens, and it, it messes with the heart's uh, conduction system, puts it in a, into immediate ventricular fibrillation. They're very likely going to be very responsive to defibrillation as long as they get it done early and CPR is started right away. So um, they, they have a really good chance of coming back out of that, but we have to be able to get there and get that stuff done right away. Again, the streaming videos uh, don't work on my uh, uh, hangouts here. All right, moving on to abdominal injuries. Oops, too fast. Again, open or closed, internal bleeding. There's all sorts of organs that are running through that abdominal cavity that can uh, uh, bleed and bleed a lot that uh, we can't even, we might not ever see. So blunt trauma to the abdomen, penetrating trauma, all sorts of things. One of the keys on, uh, on the belly is the peritoneal lining uh, is really sensitive to foreign stuff. So if you're bleeding in there or you have a problem, abdominal pain is one of your first signs and that, that, that comes in pretty quickly. So um, there's one special type of a, a wound. It's called an evisceration. It's where you have an open wound to the abdomen and the abdominal organs are coming out. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, if bleeding is getting worse, it's going to get there. Nausea, weakness, and the thirst comes into play, but we don't want to do anything. We don't do any oral uh, uh, fluids. A uh, couple of reasons. Um, if they're nauseated, we don't want them puking back up. And if there's bleeding or if you have an open uh, in, uh, gastrointestinal wound, we don't want to be adding any more stuff into there. Um, anything, if you've got a blunt trauma to the chest, assume the ab abdomen was involved. And if you think the abdomen was involved, be prepared or strongly think of chest and pelvis involvement as well. You start seeing things like coughing or vomiting blood, uh, full, uh, excuse me, firm or distended abdomen, painful abdomen when you palpate it, uh, rectal or uh, uh, vaginal bleeding, um, those are all uh, things to watch for. Um, because there's a large incidence of the nausea that can lead to vomiting, we have airway issues, so we want to be prepared with suction. If we have an isolated, uh, and we don't have any musculoskeletal injuries to the extremities, oftentimes letting them flex their knees while they're on their back or on a backboard or on the cot can take tension off those abdominal muscles and uh, help with some pain control. Uh, oxygen and then uh, treat for shock, even if they're not showing it, anticipate it happening. If you do use uh, mast or the pneumatic anti-shock garments, uh, put them on. Uh, in certain circumstances, some guidelines, you maybe only are going to inflate the, uh, the leg portions instead of the, uh, the third abdominal one. Uh, it depends on the system and the type of wound. Aggressively watch the, uh, the vital signs. If you end up having this evisceration problem, so they have a wound to the belly where uh, abdominal organs are coming out, and usually this will be intestine. Um, we don't want to do anything with what's out. Um, we want to put a sterile dressing, if possible, certainly clean, but sterile, if at all possible. Um, and with these, um, I would tend to, if there's not a lot of bleeding along with it, I would probably try and use either uh, probably like a burn dressing that doesn't have a lot of linty or fuzzy kind of stuff to it because this stuff's going to end up needing to be debrided. And it, you want to have it just slightly moistened with sterile water um, and then putting a bulkier dressing over that um, because we want to, uh, if it's a lar especially a large one, we want to keep, uh, keep it warm and uh, we don't want it to lose a lot of uh, fluid. Um, this may be open bowel, so you maybe have an evisceration including now bowel contents that are out and that's going to probably be very, very uh, visually distracting and gross. Um, probably not terribly good smelling either. Um, I've dealt with two of these. One was just a tiny little, about the size of my thumb. A guy was pushing a, uh, a glass tabletop into the back of a pickup truck. It broke and sliced into his belly. He had just this small little protrusion. Uh, was basically more like a hernia, just a small little protrusion of uh, intestine coming out. And the other one uh, was quite dramatic. A uh, motorcyclist was doing some dirt bike riding, a bit of jump, came down and just kind of a freak deal, caught a small piece of a branch on a stump of a tree 
but it tore just right in between some abdominal muscle and literally looked like a one pound package of Johnsonville brats or pulp you know, uh, uh, in a package. No open, the, the um, intestines stayed intact, there was no loss of uh, contents, uh, he was in a lot of pain, but we were able to get him to a trauma center, they were able to finish the incision, They ins essentially they take, go in, flush everything out, make sure that there's nothing else wrong. Uh, very lucky young man, um, was out of the hospital two days later, there was no other, no other problem. But again, uh, that one we had to, to cover up and uh, so we put a, a clean, sterile, sterile uh, small dressing over the, and then a bulkier dressing just to kind of maintain the warmth. Again, remember impaled objects, unless it is in the, uh, affecting the airway in the cheek or mouth, we leave it in place. Um, uh, if we have a muscle, uh, you see, just stabilize it where it is. And uh, if it's in the chest, um, you may have to try and create an occlusive dressing around the impaled object and then stabilize around that. That's one of those ones where it, you have to become somewhat creative. All right, that pretty much covers it. So we'll do some more skills practice in class, but if you have some specific questions, uh, send me an email, jfoxmedic at gmail.com, or uh, text or a Hangouts request, and uh, I'll see you on the street or see you back in class.